uh, it's going to take me about 30 seconds to get ready. So what I'd like you to do, if you could all stand up, please. And I would like everyone to hear their words, you are loved by God, at least twice from two different people. So what that means is you've got to find somebody close to you and tell them verbally, looking them in the eyes, saying you are loved by God. All right, so everyone needs to hear that twice. So that means everyone's going to have to speak it a couple times, too. All right, so go ahead. You are loved by God. Right. You are loved by God. I want to tell you a little story. This is a true story, and I do have permission from the person to tell this story. It's about my, uh, my niece. Her name is Chelsea. And um, in our family, we have a rather large family, and we like to get together for family gatherings. And what we often do is we play games, dice games, card games, things like that. And for some reason, we started this tradition of instead of calling people by their real names when we do the scorecard, we have a game name. So, you know, one person's name might be Princess, and others might be, you know, Nutcracker. My name is Harley. <laughs> Harley Davidson. All right. Um, and one time, so we were, we were playing these games, and the guy uh, who uh, was taking, you know, was keeping score looked at my niece, Chelsea, and said, okay, today your game name is going to be Worthless. That was all of our, we were like, what? Worthless? But interestingly enough, no one challenged it. I think he was kind of trying to be funny or jesting in some odd way. And uh, so no one challenged it. So the whole entire game, whenever the dice got to her, she was called worthless. Now, I don't know if he knew this or not, but Chelsea often struggled with self-worth. And she struggled with things like um, insecurities and stuff like that. So for her to be called worthless was not just funny, it was deeply, deeply painful. It just confirmed everything she thought about herself. So what she did was after the game was over that night, she went to her father, my brother, and told him what happened. And he said, Chelsea, he emphatically told her, you are not worthless. You are loved by God. God cares about you more than you will ever know. And he assured her that, indeed, she was loved. Hey, we're getting some serious feedback here. Now it's on. That's not on. Um, in fact, what he did was he went out and he bought her a silver bracelet. And on that bracelet, he had inscribed the word loved. He said, that's how God sees you. Now, the next time we got together to play games, my brother stepped in at the very beginning of the game, and he said to whoever was keeping score at the time, Chelsea is not worthless. You've got to change her name to something to reflect who she is. So the person keeping score said, wow, you're right. Let's call her Worthful. So her name became Worthful to reflect who she really was. Now, in the same way, our Heavenly Father has some very specific ways of describing who we are in the Bible. It calls Christians all kinds of names. And when we live into those names, when we recognize them, when we live into them, into the names that God calls us, and we do not live into the names that people call us, or the devil calls us, or the world calls us, we can become all that God has for us to be. Now, I've been hanging out in 1 Peter a lot the last couple months, doing a pretty intensive study. And it's interesting, in 1 Peter, there's a lot of descriptions of believers and what God says about believers. So we're going to look at a few of them. There's dozens of them, but we're only going to look at maybe five or six today. So let's jump in. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he says this, To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and lots of other lands I can't pronounce, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. We are elect and we are chosen. Now, when I hear the word chosen, one thing that comes to mind is grade school or junior high school. Remember, maybe I'm the only one, but do you, do you ever remember picking teams like for softball or soccer or kickball or something? And there was always the two best people in the class would get up front and they'd be the captains. Were any of you here ever those people who were doing the picking? And you want to, all right, there's one back there. We did not like you. 
I'm glad you raised your hand. That was very bold, but we did not like you because I was never that person. So the captains would get up and they'd say, okay, I'll pick Dave and I'll pick Noah and I'll pick you and I'll pick Cindy. And I was always pretty close to last. Not always last, but pretty close. And um, it was terrible. But here we see in God's word that he has selected us. He's elected us. He has chosen us to be on his team. And it's a beautiful thing. So if you're a Christian here today, i got to tell you, it's because God chose you. He spoke to your heart, you responded, and he chose you. 1 Peter 5, verse 10 says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So God calls us, one of the, the names he calls us is elect. He calls us elect, he calls us called, and he calls us chosen. But why does it matter? Aren't they just words? Why does it matter? Well, this is why. You see, when we believe that we are followers of Jesus primarily through our choosing, I have decided to follow Jesus. If we think of it as primarily our choice, we chose God, it can lead to things like pride. It can lead to things like arrogance. It can lead towards thinking that God owes me something because I chose him. It's like, God, I chose you, so you owe me wealth, you owe me health, you owe me a good relationship, you owe me long life. You owe me all these things because I chose you. That's what it can lead to. And if you've ever had those thoughts, maybe it's because somewhere deep inside it's because I chose God. He owes me all these things. Now, yes, we must you know, consciously put our faith in Christ. We must respond to his calling. It's kind of a two-way street. However, when we understand that we are called and we're chosen by God, when we really grasp who he says we are in this area, that you are chosen, it changes everything. It flips the perspective. It's like, wow, God, you, you chose me to be on your team? You know, I'm, I'm up here in this line and, you know, people are getting picked. I'm almost last. They're like, no, I chose you first. I died for you. I chose you first. It changes our whole perspective. It, we see ourselves as recipients of his undeserved mercy and grace and love. That's how we start to see it. In fact, we start to see that we wouldn't even be in a position to choose him if he hadn't extended that grace to us and if he hadn't extended that mercy to us. When we see that God called us we humbly desire to serve and obey him because we understand he's the one who chose me. We understand that God doesn't owe me anything. This is a big one. When we understand that God's the one who chose us, he doesn't owe us anything. But we owe him our very lives. We owe him everything because he chose us to be on his team. We understand that life is all about him. The second thing I see here in 1 in Peter is God says, you belong to me. That's a beautiful thing. In 1 Peter 2, chapter 9 and 10, uh, I'm sorry, verses 9 and 10, this is probably my favorite set of verses in all of 1 Peter. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are a people for God's own possession. We're people for his own possession. That means we don't belong to ourselves. That's hard for us in America, isn't it? We're so individualistic, we're so self-sufficient, we're self-made, we're self-fulfilling, we're self-destructive. We are not our own people. God owns us when we put our faith and our trust in him. 
And he called us as his people out of darkness into this marvelous light, the scripture says. And he says, now we collectively are the people of God. We're the people of God. That's who he calls us. This is who he says we are. So it's our job to live into that and, and live out this life of what it means to be called a person of God's possession and a, a person who's a part of the, the body of Christ, the people of God. It's to be, you know, to be a person of God, part of the people of God. It's more than just a label. It's more than just an idea. It's more than just a philosophy or something like that. It's to know that we've been called by God, that we've been chosen by God, that we've been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, that we've been called to be a people of God's own possession. And therefore, we need to commit every ounce of our being to serving and loving him. That's what it means, because we belong to God. It's one of the things he calls us. So what else does God have to say about who we are? Well, like I said, there's dozens of them, but I got a couple more for you here. Again, back to 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. He calls us living spiritual stones, okay? <clears throat> so I brought a stone with me today. There's not much life in a stone, is there? Looks kind of dead, doesn't it? But God says that we are living spiritual stones. If we go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, that's Jesus, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, he's almost saying we're like Jesus in some way, we are built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, God sees us and he calls us living stones. He's breathed life into something that's dead, but we're, we're living stones. Now, what the, the purpose of the stone, as it says in Scripture, is to be built into a spiritual house. And the spiritual house is a place where God can dwell, a place where God can live, a place where God can do good in the world and work by his Holy Spirit. Now, part of the problem and part of the issue is we don't see ourselves this way some of the time. We might see ourselves as a spiritual stone, but again, because we're kind of individualistic, sometimes we're okay to just be off here hanging out by ourselves. But what we got to understand is as a spiritual stone, the only way we're going to be built into a house is if every one of us builds one upon another to build this spiritual house of God. It's called the kingdom of God. It's called the church of Christ. It's called the body of Christ. So we all need to find our place in the kingdom. We all need to find our place in this spiritual house. I can't tell you how dismayed I am sometimes when I, I speak with people who are believers to whatever degree, they're Christians, they say, but they have no desire to fellowship with other believers. Now, you're here today, and you do, obviously, and that's a beautiful thing. But it's got to break the heart of God when people claim to be Christians, and they don't understand that they're a spiritual rock which God wants to build up into this house of praise and worship and have everyone functioning in the way that he has ordained. So you and I are living, breathing, spiritual stones. Our job is to live into what that means. Find our place in the kingdom of God. Be a place where God can dwell and live and work. When we do that, it's a beautiful thing. God calls us holy priests. In this same, in this same scripture here, God calls us a holy priesthood. This is pretty incredible. He says, you also, like living stones, are built into a spiritual house. And why are we built into a spiritual house? It's to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So you see, if you are a Christian, if you've committed your life to Christ, God sees you as a holy priest. Ever think of yourself as a holy priest? You are part of the holy priesthood. Now, priests were servants of God. They were servants of God. And one of the things they did was they offered sacrifices on behalf of the people. And they did other things, too. They 
they worshiped, they did all kinds of things, but they were servants of God. Now the good thing is we don't have to offer sacrifices of goats and lambs and doves and all that stuff anymore because Jesus did that, okay? He's the high priest, he did that, he sacrificed himself. But God still calls us priests. So what's left for us to do if there's no lambs and goats and whatnot to sacrifice? Well, there's really lots left for us to do. You see, what he says here is as priests, we are to offer spiritual uh, sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Spiritual sacrifices. So now we say, okay, well, what are the spiritual sacrifices that Peter's referring to? Well, again, there's probably dozens of them, but we're just going to look at a couple. First of all, in 1 Peter 2.9, just a couple of verses further, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So one way for us as priests to fulfill our priestly duties out of love for God is to proclaim his excellencies. We are to worship him. Now, one of my, one of my favorite ways of worship, I got to tell you, I enjoy worshiping with all of you here today. The praise team is awesome. The hymns are awesome. You guys are great. But I got to tell you, it's not my favorite way to worship. I'll, I'll show you my favorite way to worship. You know, just as priests in the Old Testament, they had gowns and they had things tied on them and they had stuff they wore and whatnot. Okay, that's what they were. This is my favorite way to worship. So first what I do is I put these little gloves on. All right. So I get these little black gloves. Uh, where's the other one? Yeah, here we go. And then after I get my, my little black gloves on, what I do is, let's see, what else do I have? I got to take these glasses off. I get my way cool biking glasses out. All right, see, these are way cool, aren't they? What do you think? These are prescription biking glasses, too. So then I get my helmet out. And uh, I put on my helmet. I'm not quite ready for worship yet, all right? I top it off with my Harley Davidson shirt, all right? So I put my Harley Davidson shirt on, all right? So now this is, this is how I prefer to worship. And then what I do is I get on my motorcycle, and I go for a ride somewhere, and I try and pick places that are really awesome and really beautiful. Like I'll go riding by lakes and rivers and streams and through the woods and through uh, you know, by fields and just out there in nature. And then what I do is I, sometimes I put on my radio, my Harley Davidson has a really cool sound system, so I crank up the sound, I'll put worship tunes on, and I'm driving down the road, and I've got cruise control too, so I put it on cruise control, so that way I can kind of hang on with one hand and with the other hand, I'm praising God, and worshiping God, and you should see the looks I get sometimes. <laughs> When you're at a stop sign and you've got praise music blaring like that and you're going, hallelujah, thank you, God, for this awesome day. I love you, Lord. And then you look around and the guy mowing his lawn is looking at you and the guy, it's, it's pretty funny. But that's my favorite way of worshiping God, my absolute favorite way. I really connect with God. I have the rumble under my seat of the Harley. I've got the wind going through my hair. All right, I got the wind blowing by me. Uh, got the smells, I'm just, it's just an awesome, awesome thing. So what's your favorite posture of worship? How do you connect with God? How do you fulfill that priestly, I hate to even call it duty, it's not a duty, it's an awesome opportunity we have to, to praise God and, and sing of his virtues and of his excellencies. What's your favorite way of doing that? Maybe you need to get a new favorite way, mix it up a little bit, get a I'll take you for a ride on my Harley, and you can see what I'm talking about, all right? It's awesome. So we get to praise him. What else do we get to do? Another spiritual sacrifice is doing good. And if we look in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16, the writer says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It's acceptable to God. Remember back here it said we're supposed, as, as priests, we're supposed to have spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ Jesus? Well, in Hebrews, he specifically says, whenever we do good 
And that's good according to God's standards. Whenever we help people, whenever we feed the poor, whenever we minister to someone here, we're doing good. We're doing God's will. We are fulfilling our, our priestly vows as Christians by performing and doing things that are acceptable to God. It's a beautiful thing. In fact, I would challenge you to uh, read through 1 Peter because there's, a, there's a, a main theme in Peter of doing good. There's a whole bunch of stuff in 1 Peter. It doesn't matter if you're being persecuted or tortured or talked about. We're supposed to do good because it's pleasing to God as the priests that we are. We're also supposed to sacrifice ourself. You know, if we're going to sacrifice anything, the Word tells us to sacrifice ourself. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. He says, This is our spiritual service, to present our bodies to God. Not be fashioned by according to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you see, he doesn't mean to kill ourselves. You know, we're not supposed to kill ourselves to, to sacrifice ourselves. What he means is that we are supposed to say, God, I just want to give every ounce of my being to you. And yes, even my body. Lord, what do you want to do with me? Am I waking up today saying, Lord, what do I want to do? Or am I saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm just giving myself to you today, Lord. I'm sacrificing myself for you. So you are a royal priest if you put your faith in Christ. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So what areas of your priestly calling are you doing well at? I'm sure we're all doing well at some of this area of priestly calling. But I'm sure we're all not doing so well in certain areas. So I'd just like to challenge you today to think about that. What areas do I need to live into to kind of hone and refine to fulfill that priestly calling that God has on my life? So are you starting to see how important it is to see who God says we are? To understand what the Word of God says we are as believers? Because you see, when we understand who we are, it tells us who we should become. It tells us what we are to be. I actually had a very practical thing happen this week. I was working with Linda from your church here. I believe she's your administrative assistant. I don't know if Linda's here today. Um, and she sent me a copy of the bulletin. I guess she needed to show me what was going on and where I was going to speak and all that. So I'm looking through the bulletin and I see accompanist, acolyte, chorister, you know, Noah Blouse is the chorister. Now I know what that means because I saw him do it today. I didn't know what that meant. Um, and then it got, about halfway down, it says, Messenger, Kent Gerhardt. Messenger. I've never had that listed in a bulletin like that before. It actually caused me to stop and think. Messenger. Hmm. You see, I usually think of myself as a guest speaker. You know, one of those guys who flies into town on a flying carpet and they're gone and, you know, it's like uh, second fiddle or backup quarterback or just waiting for the real guy to come back next week, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but when I saw a messenger, I thought, wow, messenger. I, I actually stopped and thought about it. I'm like, okay, a messenger brings a message. Well, what message am I bringing today? Oh, my goodness, I'm bringing a message based on the word of God. Yikes. It just sort of hit me. Is it, is it Paul that told Timothy to handle the, the word of God accurately? I'm like, oh my goodness. So what it caused me to do is I actually went back through my notes. I went back through what I had of a message on Wednesday. And I had to change some things. I looked up some more meanings of things. I dug a little deeper. I changed some things. Actually, I took some things out because I wasn't convinced I wasn't convinced that I was handling something quite accurately. And it was all because of, the, of who you said I was. Crazy. Now, if being called messenger versus guest speaker can instill that kind of reaction in me, what happens when you and I dig into the word and start looking up all the things that God says about us? 
That should inspire us. It should motivate us to say, God, who do you say I am? How can I live in to what you want me to be? And that's why it's so important. Because when you do, when you really look into that and you really want to understand who God wants you to be, you might just find some things in your life that need changing too. You just might find some things. All right, we got two more. Everybody with me? Raise your hand if you're still with me. If you're asleep, don't raise your hand. Uh, there's one hand went up. All right, Chris is asleep. <clears throat> you want to come up here and wear my motorcycle suit? I know you, got, you like to do that kind of stuff. So, <clears throat> See, that woke him up. All right, two more. God says that we're sanctified. 1 Peter 1, 2. He says, To you who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Now, what is sanctification? That's one of those words I had to go look up. Because I thought, well, I think I know what it is. So I went to my Bible dictionary. And you can do this too. If you don't have one, just go to like BibleGateway.com or something like that. You can look up biblical definitions of words. And what it said was sanctify means to set apart as sacred and to be made holy. So if you're a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, it says that you are sanctified. It's through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. You are set apart to be made holy. Wow. How many of you coming in today thought of yourself as set apart for God to be holy? I mean, I hope we all did. But that's like crazy. He set us apart to be holy. We're sprinkled with his blood. Well, what does that mean? Well, I think part of what that means is, you know, we've got the Old Covenant, but then we've got the New Covenant, the New Testament. Jesus shed his blood, and when we put our faith in him, we are in essence saying, Jesus, I want to enter into this New Covenant with you. You shed your blood for me. You were the ultimate sacrifice. That's your part. Now, my part of the covenant is to enter into that because I've put my faith in you. It's kind of a two-way street. And now I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to allow you to to sanctify me through your blood. I'm going to allow you to, to help me to live in ways that are holy and righteous and upright because that's my part of the covenant. I'm going to live into what you've already said I am. I'm sanctified. I'm holy. And he empowers us to do that. He doesn't just declare us holy. He empowers us to do that through his Holy Spirit. I had another situation uh, come up this week. Uh, my, my wife went down to the shore, as she likes to do, and uh, so she went and visited the sh with her sister and some of my other family members, uh, went down to Wildwood Crest for a few days. I'm not a real shore guy, and I had a lot of work to do, but <clears throat> like I said, I do like to ride my Harley. So uh, I decided to pick a nice sunny day, and I went down to the shore as well. So on Wednesday, I got on my bike, and I'm cruising down to the shore. And of course, I'm driving with one hand and worshiping and praising. And I get to the shore, and I, I find the condo, and I go in, and I kind of unpack my stuff. And I'm like, ah, it's time for lunch. I'm going to go out to lunch. So I had some crab cakes. And then I came back, and I had a nap. And that was really cool. And then I got up, and I was chatting with my son-in-law and my nephew for a while. And I'm like, you know what I didn't do when I went to the shore? I didn't go to the beach. All right? I'm just not a beach guy. I, I, you know, Cindy loves the sand, the sticky air, the heat, the sun, the salt water. I don't like the sand, the sticky air, the heat, the sun, the salt water, you know. So I didn't go to the beach. But I have to tell you, there's one other reason that I didn't go to the beach that day. And that's found in the book of Job. You see, in the book of Job, it says... In Job 1, uh, 31, verse 1, it says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at young women. All right? Now I'm a guy. Anybody else here a guy? Oh, there's only two. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm the only one who wrestles with being a guy. Sorry. Um, but you see, like Job, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I made a covenant with God. I made a covenant... Um, my wife and I are going to be married 40 years, 40 years, 4-0. Four 
uh, in August. So, you know, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. Uh, I made a covenant with her 40 years ago. Um, and part of that covenant had to do with purity, to stay in hers, and she would stay mine, and we would be in love, and we'd live happily ever after and all that, you know. But like Job, I was like, you know what, if I'm going to be a man of God, if I'm going to be someone who is sanctified, if I'm going to be someone who is living into this calling to be set apart and to be holy for God, then there's, my part is to live into that and do it. So one of the reasons I didn't go down there is because if you've ever been to the beach, you know that there's lots of people there and there's dozens if not hundreds of half-naked women all over the place. And when you're trying to live in sanctified ways and keep your thoughts pure and keep your mind pure, that's not a real good place to, well, it's actually a really good place to practice it because um, you have a lot of object lessons. But, you know, I figured I'm just not going to put myself in that position. Out of sight, out of mind. It's really true. Why even put myself in that position? So I just napped and worked on my message and ate seafood and it was a beautiful thing. Now you're going to, you know, some of you might be sitting there saying, isn't that kind of extreme? Come on. You don't go to the beach just because of that. And I'm saying no. In fact, it may not be extreme enough. Was it Paul? Somebody said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Is that too extreme? I say no, it's not extreme enough. Because when you understand who God says you are, in this case, he says you are sanctified, you're set apart for holiness. That means there's a lot of things you can do. You can, there's lots of righteous, holy, cool things that we can do as Christians. But there's a lot of stuff over there that we, stay, we run from because that's who God says we are. So no, I don't think it's extreme at all. There's one more. All right, there's dozens. You've got to go home and read about this stuff. It's awesome. There's dozens of them. There's dozens of descriptions of who we are according to God's word. But there's one more fundamental thing that we all have to get or else the others don't really totally fall into place. And that is that God says that you and I, those who have put their faith in Christ, are sons and daughters. We are his children. In Romans 8, 14 to 16, Paul says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So you see, if you put your faith in Christ, you are an adopted child, you are an adopted member of of his family. You're a son or a daughter. You're literally a son or daughter of the creator of the universe. Being a son of God or a daughter of God is something we throw around kind of loosely in Christendom. Some people think, well, everybody's a child of God. He created us. We're all children of God. You know, we've watered it down. But the word of God says if you've put your faith in him, in fact, the apostle Paul goes so far as to say, the thing that identifies someone as a child of God are people who are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Those are who are called God's children. If that's you, you are a son or daughter of the king of the universe. That's a beautiful thing. It's not just a title. So now it's up to you and I to live into that, to live into all it means to be a son or daughter of God and to walk in ways that are worthy of taking on his name because we've been adopted into his family. It's just a Incredibly awesome thing. Do you remember Chelsea, my, my niece that I started out with? Um, I called her last week and I said, Chelsea, how are you doing, you know, with all of this feelings of insecurities and, you know, just how are you doing with all that stuff? You know, how, how's it going these days? And this is what Chelsea said. This is what she wrote back. It's, and Chelsea's just a beautiful young lady. She's serving God. Um, she says, Uncle Kent, I'm doing much better. And she has two exclamation marks, okay? I'm doing much better. I still have my insecurities and times where I feel in over my head and not good enough. But thankfully, now I never see myself as worthless. And why? 
because I know I am a daughter of the king. I know I'm here for a reason. Now I know my worth. You see, as a daughter of a king, it's given her purpose. It's given her mission. It's given her vision. It's given her a new trajectory for her life. It's given her so many things just by understanding that she's a daughter of the king. And God loves her and cares for her and wants the best for her. And now what Chelsea's doing is her part. She's embracing all of what the Lord has said she is, and now she's actively living that out. She's taking steps to pursue God. She's pursuing ministry. She's pursuing loving on other people in the context of youth ministry and teaching ministry and all kinds of things. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's all because she now sees herself as a daughter of the king, of who God says she is. It's helping her to conquer her insecurities and to see herself as a beloved child of God. It's just a beautiful thing. I'd like to invite the, uh, the praise team to come on back up. And I think we're going to sing that song again, Who You Say I Am. And as we sing it this time, I would like this to be kind of a prayer, kind of, an, kind of a way of just saying, God, I don't know how I've seen you before, and I don't know how I've looked at the way you see me before. Maybe I'm really good in some of these areas, but maybe not. So as we sing this song, let's sing it and say, God, help me to understand who you say I am. Help me to live into that every day. I'm chosen. I'm not forsaken. I'm your child. I am who you say I am. So why don't you stand with us and we'll sing together. God sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. 